I knew 20 some odd years ago, 22, 23, 24 years ago. Well, let me just be, let me be exact about this. I accepted the Lord Jesus in 1962. And then just, oh, just less than a year after that, which would have been close to 25 years ago, I guess, I began to realize as I read the Bible, I'd never read the Bible before. I was raised in a Christian home, but I didn't pay attention to reading the Bible. Let mama do that. I, I never had read it for myself. And I began to see things all the way through here about faith. It looked like everybody that did anything did it by faith. And when they did something by faith, the results were absolutely miraculous. And I, and I, I began to see, hey, this, this, this faith business, this is where this thing is. I, and if I can get a handle on that, if I can ever figure out where that is and how to get my hands on it, why, then the things that I do will also wind up with miraculous results. Well, I don't know. It seemed like everywhere I went, I'd, I'd say something to a, a preacher or a pastor. I'd say something to uh, some other Christian. I'd say, boy, uh, tell me how to use faith. And they'd look at me kind of strange and say, well, you never know what God's going to do or some other, some other something like that, or you better be careful about that faith stuff. And I, I couldn't figure out why, why is everybody like that? I'd go to church and they'd say, you need faith. And I'd say, yeah, that, yeah, uh-huh, amen. And, and they'd say, well, I'll tell you what, uh, the next sermon, the next Sunday would be, this is what happens with faith. And, you, and here again are those same things that I'd been reading and find out about all this powerful faith people and what faith would do. And then, they'd, and then the next Sunday or so, we'd preach, you know, on this is what happens when you don't have faith. And I'd say, whoo, yeah. And boy, I know next Sunday's it. Next Sunday, he's going to tell me where to get it and what to do with it. And I'd go down the next Sunday and Oh, you know, we preach on something like Paul's thorn in the flesh or poor old Job and, and um, you know, and, and then another Sunday or two about how God's going to kill me and, and he'd break my leg just to get to heal it and, and then I couldn't get healed without faith and, and I couldn't feel it. What, what it <laughs> somebody tell me where this thing is. Just had me so frustrated. And then I'd go out and I'd say, tell me how to use faith. You better have some wisdom in this. You don't want to get off into wildfire. No, I want it in the faith. And it was absolutely frustrating me. And I prayed and I sought God. And, and uh, this quest for faith has been in my life ever since I've been a Christian. All these years, I've had this thing in me about faith. I want to know about faith towards God. And I found out in the book of Hebrews, it's one of the principal doctrines of Jesus Christ. So, I'm going to share some things with you as we go concerning the things that I have been blessed to learn and find out over the last 25 years or so concerning faith and our use of it day by day by day. And it's not a wildfire subject. Praise God, sometimes it gets wild and it's full of fire, but it's not some spooky thing that, that God don't want you to know about. No, praise God. It is a gift of God, and we need to find out more about it. So as we go into it today, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll ask God by His Spirit to rise within us and open the eyes of our understanding about this fabulous, fascinating, powerful thing that God, by Jesus Christ, has made available to you and to me. Father, we praise you today. We worship you on this broadcast. And I ask you in the name of Jesus to rise and live big within us all, flood our hearts with understanding and spiritual wisdom concerning the faith of God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to Hebrews chapter 11. You are a spirit. God is a spirit. You are a spirit. To be a spirit being doesn't mean that it isn't real. Some people have the idea that the spirit realm is some, some hooky-pooky thing that nobody can really know anything about. No, no, no. 
the spirit realm is more real than this material realm. Just because you can't see it and most of the time can't feel it does not mean that it isn't real. That just means you're not perceiving it. A spirit created all matter. So since when did the matter become more real than the creator? No, you know, that, that can't be so. So to be a spirit literally means that you were created by God on a level and in a class that can and should and would fellowship and have association to be an associate with God in the, uh, and to associate with deity itself. I mean, he has come to us in Jesus of Nazareth. God manifested in the flesh. Now, a spirit being is, like I said, real. When, <laughs> forget about the Casper the Friendly Ghost idea about what spiritual things are, okay? You remember that little cartoon character, Casper? That, that uh, you know, he's just, he just got a round head and two eyes in, in the, and he covered up with a sheet. I mean, and he's just floating around through there and this sheet just trailing around behind. No, no, no. That's not what a spirit being is at all. If I could step out of my body and you could see my spirit, see me, you're not looking at me, you're looking at my body. And you're really not seeing much of my body because my body is clothed. Well, my spirit is clothed. My body's clothed and then my spirit is clothed with my body. And if you could see my body and my spirit at the same time, they would look just alike because a spirit being, a spirit man has hands, head, eyes, legs, feet. I mean, you couldn't tell the difference. He, that is the eternal being, the eternal man. This body is just simply a vehicle in which I travel, in which you travel, in this earth realm, which is material, so that we can have contact with material things. If you did not have your body, then this table would not be solid to you as a spirit. I mean, uh, Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, said, handle me, a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have. Even his resurrected body was flesh and bone, see, a physical body, yet it had no blood in it, the glory of God flowing in his veins in a glorified body, which he just walked through the door after having dinner with him, sat down and ate with him, then walked through the door without opening it. So he's functioning in the supernatural realm. That don't mean the spook realm. That <laughs> means supernatural, authority over the natural realm, which is the realm of the spirit or the spirit world where God is God. Amen. So in order to live in this natural physical world, two things have to happen. One, you have to have a body, this body of flesh. Number two, you have to have authority in this earth. The only thing that has authority in this earth has full, absolute, God-given right to be here is a human being and all of the things that are subordinate to him, the animals, the birds, the trees. Now, there's stuff here. I mean, the devil's here. He's, he's a spirit being. He's just as real as God. He's not as powerful, but he's just as real. He's been stripped of his power. He wasn't created in, in, in God's realm to start with. He's in the angelic realm. So he's not in the same class with God. He just tries to be God. He's not God. But in order to have authority in this, in this earth and to belong here and to have uh, authority here, the earth was created for man and all of the things that are subordinate to him that were given to him for his pleasure and for his benefit. So you have to have this body. How do you get a body? You have to be born of 
a woman. You have to come through the womb of a woman to have this body of flesh. That's the reason the Holy Spirit could not go to the cross. He had to have a body. So the body was born of the Word of God in the womb of a little virgin girl named Mary. Praise God. So now you see the realms of authority. For a spirit to have authority in this physical, natural earth in full expression, you have to have a body. That's the reason the devil wants your body. That's the reason the demons want your body. That's also the reason God wants you to offer your body to him as a sacrifice and allow his spirit to reign and to reside in your body and in my body. That gives the Holy Spirit full range of expression in this human world. Praise God. Now, you are a spirit. You have a soul which is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul is in your spirit. You can't separate your soul and your spirit. When your soul and your spirit are separated from your body, your body will lay down and die, but your spirit doesn't. Your spirit will exist and be alive and in existence forever. So if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, your spirit has been recreated or what Jesus termed being born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5 says. So... If you've been born again, the body, is, you're separated from your body. Your body lays down and goes back to the dust of the earth. This body belongs in this earth. That's what it was created for, and this is where it belongs. And I'll tell you, this is where it will spend eternity. After the resurrection, when the body is raised and your spirit and your soul are reunited with your body, then there's coming a time when Jesus and all like him, and what I mean by like him, this body will be resurrected into a glorified state just like his it is, was and is. He's going to return with all the rest of us to this earth. And he's going to be here and we'll be here for a thousand years. At the end of what's called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, at the end of that time, we will be moved away from this earth for just a short time and the earth will be totally renovated by fire and then the Bible says we will, we will reside on it again and God himself will move the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city from heaven and bring it to earth and forever God will reside with his man on earth instead of demanding man to reside with him in heaven. He's going to make heaven and earth combine and it's going to be more fabulous than heaven is now and more fabulous than the earth ever was. Praise God. Woo-hoo-hoo. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Now, I said all that because I wanted you to see that this body is not you, this body is not me, this thing's temporary in the state that it's in right now. It will be eternal once it's resurrected. I might better ought to just finish that though right now because the unborn again man that dies, his spirit is incarcerated temporarily in hell, which is in the bowels of this earth, in the center of the physically, in the center of the earth. He'll be incarcerated there See, earth was made for man, and that's where he's going to spend it. He's on the earth. And now it doesn't mean that he can't travel to the stars and all of that. That's all going to come later under the hand of God. But this, this earth for right now, this is it, okay? The unborn again man, the man that's never changed gods, he's allowed the devil to dominate him and never made Jesus Christ the Lord of his life not because God wants to punish him, because God's made Jesus available to anybody that will. It's because he's rejected him. He is going, the minute his body is separated from his soul and his spirit, his body will die and go back into the earth, and then his spirit is going to be incarcerated in hell itself in the center of the earth. Then, when the time comes, called the second death, the, his body will be resurrected and reunited with his 
old unborn again spirit and his old unrenewed soul. And he is going to have his body, his soul, and his spirit will be united forever under the domination of his God, the devil. And he and the devil both will be in torment forever in the lake of fire. Every sickness and every disease, every problem still in that old body forever and can't get rid of it. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Ooh, glory to God for Jesus. Thank God we don't have to spend eternity that way. Amen. Now, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your spirit's been born again. Your soul or your mind, your will, and your emotions need to be renewed by the Word to think God's thoughts after Him. And your body needs to be made well. Your body needs to be cleaned up by the Spirit of God and the washing of the water of the Word. Your body needs to be brought into subjection to your spirit by the teaching training of the Holy Spirit to keep your body and your mind, your soul, your will, and your emotions from coming together against your spirit and trapping your spirit into this carnal, natural, physical world. Now, that's what the devil wants to happen. If he couldn't stop you from getting born again, he wants to trap you and stop you from doing anything to hinder his work, even though you did get born again, because he knows what's available to you. He's seen it before. He's, just, he's, <laughs> he's had his backside whipped good with that sword of the Spirit more than once, and he don't want you messing with him. So he's developed... Christianism, he's developed a religion that we can get over in. He's developed all kinds of religion. He's a very religious being, and he's developed all kinds of religions for us to get involved with. Communism is a religion. Uh, he's got all kinds of religions where you can worship him if you like. If you don't want to worship him, he'll get you worshiping something else, anything but to worship God. You start worshiping God is when you begin to control and take authority over his affairs. So he don't want that. He made us a religion out of Christianity to sidetrack us off of the word. And even though we've been born again, talk us into acting like we haven't been born again. Talk us into begging God, you know, oh, you know, we're just so unworthy. We're so no good. Oh, we don't deserve it. And go get off into that syndrome. Instead of saying, oh, I want to thank you, Father. I mean, I was no good and unworthy, but thank God you came anyway. You came into my unworthiness, and you came into my no goodness and brought me your worthiness and your goodness, and I'm so pleased with that. I just praise you. I have faith, and I trust in your anointing. I've been reborn. My spirit's been reborn. And, and in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this old flesh that's trying to tell me I'm no good. And I take authority over my mind with the promises of God. And I just want to praise you and think, can you hear the difference between the two? One has faith in it, the other one doesn't. So as we begin to look at this and begin to study this, we begin to realize that when we were born again, this spirit man was born of the Spirit of God. And being born of God has all the attributes and character of God in it. Now, the problem that we've had over the years is the mind and the body choking and keeping the spirit that's been reborn and actually has the Holy Spirit residing in it, keeping the character of Jesus, the love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the goodness and the, the faith and the temperance and all of these things in the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ, the Bible says, keeping all of these things, the very character of Jesus, from coming into authority 
over this flesh and manifesting in this natural physical world in the spirit and in the heart and, in the, in, and then therefore in the mind and the body of the believer and changing the circumstances around us. Now, we need to realize that when we were born again, the faith of God was deposited in there. When we were born again, the love of God, the Bible said, had been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It's not something that, that's going to come six, eight, ten months later. No, it was done when you were born again, just the way when a little child is born of its parents, it has the same features, it's the same substance, same arm, legs, eyes, ears, feet. It, it has a lot of, and all the characteristics of its parents. Well, our spiritual parent now is Jesus, and he is our father. And in the name of Jesus, we've been reborn and his attributes and likeness is right here on the inside in this spirit man, which includes faith. And that's where we're going to go with this. Now we're out of time for today. We've laid the groundwork to this. And tomorrow we're going to get into this subject of faith. And I'm not going to just do some theological uh, talk about it in some state of faith. I want to get into the subject of it, the source of it, the food of it, the substance of it, and then I'm going to show you how to use it like a mechanic uses a tool. Praise God. Hallelujah. I really had never thought about that until while I was praying that just then, just in that way, I thought about it in different ways and from different viewpoints, but while I was praying, it just flashed through my spirit that if, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, the book of Hebrews, we'll, we'll see it right here in the uh, 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Sixth verse, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if it's impossible to please him without faith, and faith is the victory that overcometh the world, then it's easy to see why God's not pleased unless you have faith because he's pleased only when we overcome in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, and through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen... Now notice this. You remember yesterday we were talking about the difference between the world of the Spirit and the material world? And we said that the world of the Spirit is not less real than the material world just because you can't see it. It's not some spooky, far-out, unreal... Uh, ungoverned world full of hobgoblins and demons. There's a lot of them out there, but the, actually, in reality, they're not in the spirit world. They are spirits, but they are governed by the spirit world. They have been kicked out of the spiritual realm by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They are working in this natural realm to destroy you and me, and we're not going to be destroyed. The Word of God said that the devil goes about as a roaring lion. Didn't say he is one. Said he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I'm telling you right now, you and I are whom's that he's not going to <laughs> devour. Praise God. Now, look at this. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen or things which are revealed to our five physical senses, things we can touch, hear, smell, taste, see, and so forth, things which are seen were not made of things which do appear or things which are seen were not made out of something that you can see. Now, I didn't say that the world was made out of nothing. People say, well, you know, in the beginning, God made the world from nothing. No, 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 no. He didn't make it out of nothing. He made it out of something you can't see. 
Now, that's very, very important. Now, he did not use some natural, physical some substance that already existed when he created the heavens and the earth, but he did make it out of something you, that that's, is a substance. Now, notice here it said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Through faith, which is a substance, I'd like to add that there for study purposes, if you read that with me now again in the first verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now you go down to the third verse. Through faith, and let's add this, which is a substance we can't see, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Well, what were they made out of? They were made out of this substance in the spirit realm that you can't see with the physical eye that the Bible calls F-A-I-T-H, faith. Now, faith then is not the product of reasoning. I want us to look at something. Hold your place there in the book of Hebrews. If we get time, we're going to come back there and see something else shortly. I want us to look in the book of Mark, the 11th chapter, and where there's a great deal to say on the subject of faith, talking about God's faith. In the 11th chapter of the book of Mark, and I want us to look here at the um, 27th verse, Mark 11, 27. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there came to him of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and say unto him, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me. I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Now listen, was it from heaven or from men? He said, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things, but I want to ask you a question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Now listen to this. They reasoned with themselves saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? If we say of men, they feared the people, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. They answered and said, Jesus, we cannot tell. Now listen to what he said. Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now why wouldn't he tell them? It wasn't because he's trying to be hard on them, but it, without faith, they wouldn't understand what he said when he told them. And they would have taken what he said and used it against him. But they reasoned among themselves. Now, here's what happens when you start reasoning about something that you don't know anything about. First place, they made up their minds what he would say, and they didn't know what he would say. They said, if we say such and such, he'll say so and so. They assumed, see. They reasoned or assumed certain things. Then they said, but if we say this, then the people are going to do it. They didn't know what the people would do. They'd come a whole lot near knowing what the people would do than they knew what Jesus would do because they didn't have any idea what he was doing or where he was going to do it next. I mean, they didn't know nothing about him. They thought they did, but they didn't. Now, they reasoned and couldn't answer. Why? Their reasonings, they began to assume as fact, and they acted on them like they were fact. But they weren't fact. They were reasonings. Now, when you start worrying about things, you start worrying about stuff that hadn't even happened yet, but you begin to act on it like it had already happened, and then you get over into fear. Worry is a manifestation of fear. It's a meditation on fear. 
then you get into a place where there's no faith. And if there's no faith, there's not any way or any grounds for God to deal with you on. Now, so then faith is not the product of reason. It is the product then of the spirit man. It is the product of the reborn human spirit. It is originally the product of the Holy Spirit. It's God's faith. It comes from the Holy Spirit of God. But when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, your spirit was recreated. Any man that is in Christ Jesus is a new creature. Old things have passed away. In other words, all the stuff that was in your spirit passed away. Your spirit was recreated. And one of the things that was deposited in your spirit is faith. Now, the reason we know that is because it's impossible to get born again without it. It is that spiritual force. It is the creative force of God. And the way God created the heavens and the earth out of something that you can't see, he recreated your spirit out of that same substance of things hoped for. And the deposit of it was made in your spirit, and it's there for you to live by and to walk by. Now, we're going to get into that in some more detail as we go. Now, I want to stay with this business of faith not being the product of reason. You, you can't reason into faith. Faith is not a state of mind. It doesn't come out of the soul. It doesn't come out of the will, the mind, or the emotions. You can have doubt and, and be ravaged with unbelief in your mind and in your thinking and still produce faith in your heart if you'll put what's in your spirit first and rebuke and renounce what's trying to take over in your head. Now, let me give you a, a little better illustration of what I'm, what I'm talking about here. In the first place, in the third chapter of the book of Proverbs, the word said, trust in the Lord with all your heart, that's your spirit man, and lean not unto your own understanding. So your understanding and your heart bound to be two different places and two different sources of thought and intent. So you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your spirit man has in and invested in it the spiritual characteristics of Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. All of the fruit of the Spirit is in there. It's God's gift of faith to you. It's faith that we live by. Or as the Word of God said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by, by faith in our heart instead of what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears and so forth. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, the 18th verse, the Lord says, well, let's just turn over there and read that. You got your Bible there. If you don't, make a note of it <clears throat> and look it up later. From uh, Isaiah, chapter 1, right next door to the book of Proverbs there where we're in the third chapter. Give me just a moment here while, <laughs> while I get all six of my thumbs straightened out. Amen. Amen. Chapter 1, the book of Isaiah. Now, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. Oh, wait a minute, brother. Come now, I thought you said faith didn't come out of reason. Now wait, now, wait a minute. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. He didn't say for you and I just to get together and reason together. I was driving out of the city limits of a town one day. I'd, I was on the highway driving cross country to go preach. Had my Bible laying there on the front seat of the car. And I drove out of this, out through, through this little town. And as I got out the other side of town, about the city limits, there was a big billboard out there that said, uh, come let us reason together, dot, 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 dot. Down at Isaiah 1, 18. And then it gave the name of the church that put that billboard up there and the name of the denomination under it. And this particular denomination, forgive me, but, but it's fact, they are famous for believing nothing. 
I'm mean. <laughs> you know, they'll argue with a post just because a post thinks it's a post. I mean, they will not believe anything. And here's this sign that said, come, let us reason together. I thought, well, dude, God, there's something wrong with that. I mean, uh, do we come together and reason about God? Do we come together and reason about healing and reason about the new birth? That's the reason these folks don't believe anything. They just get together and reason about it and come to a final conclusion that there ain't none of it left, you know? And I, I thought, well, there's something wrong about this. And, I, and, and, and my, my spirit rose up in me and... and, and you know, in resistance to that, I thought, yeah, but that's Isaiah 118. I, I, and I knew I'd read that, but I thought, what is wrong with that? And I, because I'm, I was more than a little acquainted with that particular do, denomination and, and a few churches of that denomination that I'd been in, what they call reason should have been scratched out and put argue. Come, let us argue with one another. And because that, and it's not because they just ugly folks. No, I don't, don't want to present that kind of idea at all. But somehow or another, they picked up the idea that that's what you're supposed to do. That you take the Bible and you all get together and just argue like a bunch of alley cats about it. Well, that, that, there's no faith in that at all. You, you gender strife when you do that. Well... I finally, a little bit, I was, what's the matter with this? I said it out loud. And I pulled my car over to the side of the road and flipped my Bible open to Isaiah 118. I learned a long time ago not to try to reason about it, but to go to the Word and find out what it said. And lo and behold, it does not say, come, let us reason together. It said, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. When you come and reason together with him, not about him, with him, then your reasoning has to be based on the word. The only way you're ever going to contact God in the spirit is to know him in his word. They asked Jesus, they said, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He said, those that keep my word. So, as we reason together with God and his word says by his stripes ye were healed, his word says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. We don't back away and say, yeah, but that ain't reasonable. Here's what we think about it. No, 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 no. I change the reasoning of my mind and begin to reason with my heart because I have established in my heart that the Word of God is final authority. For instance, I do not ask God if Jesus was born of a virgin. I ask God how Jesus was born of a virgin. I ask God when Jesus was born of a virgin. I ask God where Jesus was born of a virgin, but his word said he was born of a virgin. So he is born of a virgin. And my question is not to reason about that and say, ain't hey, no way, that could be so. You think I'm a fool? I ain't going to believe that. Well, now what did I do with my, what did my reasoning do when I did that? My reasoning then sliced right straight across the word, and when it did, it stopped all faith. I have to have faith to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Faith that his word is filled with integrity. Faith that, that God knows what he's doing and is not a man that he should lie. And I have accepted him, therefore I've accepted his word. I'm not talking so much about what somebody else said about his word. I thank God for the preachers that have ministered to me and preached to me throughout my lifetime. And I listen to preaching tapes all the time, man. And I build my faith that way. But I believe the word because I've gone to the word for myself, read it, studied it, prayed over it, poured over it, fed it, and ministered it into my heart. And I don't say... I use as reference, I may tell you, well, this is something that 
Charles Capps said to me, or this is something that I heard Kenneth Hagin say, or this is something I heard Oral Roberts say, or this is something I heard Jerry Savelle say, this is something I heard Happy Caldwell say, this is something I heard my wife Gloria say, or so forth, or this is something I read in a book, or so forth. I may refer to something they said, but the reason I believe Jesus is born of a virgin is because the Bible said it. The reason I believe in healing is not because I've been healed or because I haven't been healed. It's because the Bible said, by his stripes ye were healed. I don't reason my way out of that. I don't say, well, I don't know whether that really meant me or not. Yes, it does. I don't reason about God, about his word. I reason together with God in his word and faith. The faith of God is the result because Romans 10, 17 said, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's the way faith comes. That's the way faith is fed. That's the way faith is developed, that and acting on the word. It doesn't come by, by just all kinds of testings and trials. That's something that, that's not Bible at all. We're going to get into that later. Say it with me. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Say it again. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I hope you got your Bible with you there today because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what we read in Romans 10:17. And if the Word says, if that's where faith comes from, then that's where it comes from. I remember <clears throat> as, a, as a boy and uh, raised in a church, you know, I mean, I mean, my folks in church all the time, I was, I was raised right. It wasn't their fault I turned out <laughs> like I did. I mean, you know, but um, I remember uh, th I, things that I picked up along the way, I didn't, I didn't consciously or conscientiously on purpose ever learn anything when I was younger and in school and in church and so forth. But somewhere along there, I picked up that, that faith came by all the problems and the turmoils and the tests and the trials and all that. And there's nowhere in the Bible that it says that. And besides that, if that's what caused faith, everybody on earth would be a faith giant. Well, so we know that isn't true. But the Bible said, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, faith is not the product of reason. It is a spiritual force. Therefore, it is the product of the Spirit. It is a product, first of all, of the Holy Spirit. It's God's faith. The Bible said Jesus is the author of our faith in Hebrews chapter 12. So, if God's the author of it, and it's God's faith, God is a spirit, Jesus said, and those that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, that's kind of vague and, and far out un, unless you study what we did all last week and uh, what we talked about mostly yesterday and, and, and Monday, the fact that man is a spirit being. He's created in the image of God. We are a spirit. We have a soul made up of our will, our emotions, and our mind, and we live in this physical, natural body. Now, most of our education, most of our schools, and I, I'm sad to say most even of our Bible schools are not oriented in spiritual knowledge and revelation our knowledge gained by revelation from God's Word, from the Holy Spirit, and so forth. But it's natural, mental, physical knowledge gained by the five physical sense gates. Now, we're going to get into this in detail before we get out of this subject of faith, but right now we need to realize that faith doesn't come out of your mind. It doesn't come out of your reasoning uh, faculties. It comes out of your spirit. Faith is a spiritual substance. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11 where the Word of God tells us, this is where we were reading yesterday, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now the Bible said hope will, uh, that, that will not make you shame. You say, well, there's sure a lot of stuff I hope for that I didn't get. Well, now this right here could very well be the answer and most of the time it is 
why people pray for something they hope to receive and never receive it. Because hope alone, hope is wonderful. Hope is something given to us by the Lord Jesus at Calvary. I mean, we, uh, we have our hope in him. But hope without faith has no substance. It's a dream. It is in the soul realm of the imagination, the dream realm, and it never will come to pass if it doesn't have some spiritual substance to it. And you hear people say, well, we're just hoping and praying. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if that's all you're doing, that's all you're ever going to do. You're not hoping, praying, and receiving. Jesus said, whatsoever thing you, you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the supernatural, creative, living life power of God that comes out of His Spirit that has been deposited in your and my spirit when we made Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. It rises in response to our believing God's Word. God's faith is already in His Word. He believed it when He said it. And it rises to reach into the unreality, non-real world, as far as material and so forth is concerned, of hope, imagination, and dreams, and becomes the subject of that hope, and becomes the substance of that hope, and it then is the supernatural power that brings that hoped-for dream, picture, imagination, built by the promises of God and brings it into the physical manifestation that we can perceive and, and hear and touch and taste and smell and all that and so forth. Now, faith is not the product then of human reasoning. It is the product of the Spirit. We found in Isaiah 118 that said, we come reason with the Lord. Well, that kind of reasoning is on the Word. We base our reasoning together, our reasoning with ourselves, on our reasoning with the Lord. I don't reason about His Word whether or not it's true. I have settled it in my heart that it is true. And if something tells me that it isn't, then I stand in rebellion to that, not to the Word. I side in line with the Word. And my reasoning faculties have to come in line with the Word so that faith then has an opportunity to change this thing that I've been seeing that says the word's not so. If my body is sick and it tells me it's sick, and if I go around saying, yes, I'm sick, God, I'm sick, Satan, I'm sick, wife, I'm sick, child, I'm sick, pastor, I'm sick, body, you're sick, yeah, I know you're sick, yeah, you're sick. Well, all the time that I was saying all of that and reasoning all that out in my mind and going to God and say, I sure do hope to be healed. Uh, I sure hope to be healed. Yes, I believe God's going to heal me someday. Wonder why he don't ever heal me someday. Someday ain't here. Well, there's no faith in that. See, I have, by reasoning, decided that what I see is true. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. The world says seeing is believing. They don't believe anything unless they can see it. Well, how can they ever change what they see if they don't believe? Well, you see, that's backwards, and that's just right where Satan wants to keep you. But when you go to the Word of God and say, yes, the Word is so, by His stripes ye were healed. Peter said, by His stripes, ye, I mean, yeah, by His stripes you are, said Isaiah 53, and Peter said, by His stripes ye were. So if ye are and ye were, then I am. And I'm speaking by faith in line with what God has already said. Now, my body says, no, I'm not healed. I say, wait a minute. You're not, you're not me. You're just my body. And in the name of Jesus, I am healed. And out of my spirit comes the healing power of God into this body. Now, body, you respond to that. I believe I receive healing in you. I thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank God as far as I'm concerned, I'm healed. Well, now, what have I done? I've agreed with the Word, even if I had to disagree with my body. Now, that is actually a, a, 
a very fundamental of faith because the Bible said in the fourth chapter book of Romans that by faith we call things that are not as though they were. Now, let's stop right here and back up a little bit and look at this faith as a substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen, these things that we can see, the earth, the trees, the sky, and all these things around us, including our bodies, because you can trace, I can trace my flesh, my body, back through God's creation to the day that he created Adam's body, which he created out of the dust of the earth. So, God, those, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, or the modern way to say that would be that things which are seen were not made out of something you can see. It was made out of faith. It's a spiritual force. But the force of faith that you can't see is the creative force of God that becomes and is the seed to those things that you can see. So these things that you can see can be traced back to the faith of God because it was by faith God used the substance of faith to create these things. Well, let me ask you something. Doesn't just good sense tell you that if it was made from faith that it'll still respond to faith? Couldn't it be changed by faith? Let me ask you something else. Will fear change physical things? Oh, yeah. I mean, we realize that, don't we? Fear changed the color of your hair. I mean, there's, there's cases known where and documented. Uh, I, two or three that I'm thinking about right now that you can just, uh, you, if I had time to tell them to, well, one of them was a, they're out in the river that comes into Niagara Falls. There is a barge out there that is hung up on the ground. It's been there for 30 or 40 years. But the guy that was in it today and hung up didn't know it was going to sit there for 40 years. I mean, that thing broke loose up there in the Great Lakes. And I mean, it started down that river. And just a little ways before it got over Niagara Falls. Boy, I mean, you know, it's all over then. Just a little ways before it got there, it stuck. And here these guys were out in the middle of this barge and there's the Niagara Falls right there. And they finally got these guys off of this thing. I mean, they were afraid to breathe, brother. They were on there hours and hours and hours. They strung a, a breeches buoy out across there. And this, this guy hand walked across to get this breeches buoy settled and got the lines fouled up and had to go back out and start all over again. And these guys are all standing there. The next day, one of them was snow white headed and he'd been dark haired the day before. When the sun come up the next day, he was so afraid that all of his hair had turned snow white. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm talking about. Can fear make you sick? Well, medical science has already proven that fear and anxiety is one of the most sickly things, causes more problems and causes the heart to come apart, causes your joints to get into stiffness and arthritis and all of that kind of thing. Well, yeah, Brother Copeland, everybody knows that. Well, let me tell you, ask you something. Can you see fear? No, now you can see the results of it. Sometimes you can smell it. Sometimes you can sense it, but it's not something you can take out and feel of it and look at it and say, uh-huh, that's fear. That's what I, I, no, you can't do that. It's a spiritual force. Actually, fear is perverted faith. The first thing Adam said when he fell, Adam had faith in him. God invested faith in him when he made him because it's impossible to please God without faith. Right there in Hebrews 11, 6 says that. And he created Adam and said he was good. He was pleased with him, so he's bound to have faith. Well, the first thing that happened after he fell, the Bible said he was afraid of God. He feared God before he had faith in God. Adam didn't even know he had faith. Actually, that is a manifestation of faith. Is, and then really, that's the way God wants us to develop and grow. 
to where we get to the place we just believe God and walk with God like Jesus did, and, and you really don't see uh, a man being all shook up or rattled about anything. I mean, he just has faith, knows he has faith, never really gives too much attention to it, just has faith. Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and he'll send you the Holy Ghost. Now, if one of us would have said that, somebody would say, how do you know he'll sin? You never know what God's going to do. He might not do it. It might not be his will. It might not happen today. It might happen six months later. may not ever happen at all. Nya, 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 nya. Or if it was on the other end of it, we'd say, well, I'll pray the Father and I'll ask him to send the Holy Ghost. And if it be his will, he might do it. He might not do it. You never know what he's going to do. I wish he'd straighten up. Oh, no, no. That isn't what Jesus said. He said, I'll pray the Father. He said, the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, yeah, but that was Jesus. Well, he's given you his name in which to pray. Huh? Well, now you see, Jesus walking by faith. He didn't come up out there at the tomb of Lazarus and go back over there and the and say, oh my God, oh, what am I going to do? Oh God, durst thou not know that I've come upon this here funeral four days late. No, 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 he didn't do that. He just walked in there and said, roll that stone away from the door. And what did the man's sister say? Ha, ah, he stinks already. What does that have to do with anything? Oh, if you'd have just been here, uh, you know, right after he died, maybe before he started stinking, you might have been able to raise him from the dead. Now, see, that's the reasoning faculty talk. Faith is faith. I mean, he walked up there and the will of God to move the stone away from the door. They said, oh, and he said, listen, then I tell you, if you'd believe, you'd see the glory of God. He said, I am the resurrection. Lazarus, get up! <laughs> Hallelujah. If he hadn't called him by his name, I guess everybody in that graveyard got up. But he called him Lazarus and up he came. But the point I wanted to make here, Jesus knew who he was in the Father, knew how faith operated. He wasn't asking for more faith. He used what he had. And we've been given the name of Jesus and the same Holy Spirit that was residing in him and on him is available to us residing in us and available to reside on us in his name, we can move and walk and have faith in the power of the, of the living God. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? Now, so faith is a substance. Now then, faith is from God. Now I want to talk to you here a moment and unravel some things that are and, and begin to show you some things that you will really need to know as you begin to use your faith and begin to believe God and exercise your faith in your daily life. First of all, let's talk about the faith that we deal with that's from God, the faith that we are to live by. You know, the Bible said the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 uh, makes this statement, and it is, oh, I'll tell you, it, it's so simple, but yet it's one of the most profound, one of the most in-depth statements in all the New Testament. We walk by faith, not by sight. Sight standing for what we perceive by the five physical senses. In other words, I walk by faith, not by what I see. I walk by faith, not by what I just hear. I walk by faith, not by what I feel. I walk by faith and not by what I smell. Now, faith is, and believing is an action word, and we could illustrate that like this. If you were seated, say, in, a, in church, and some guy ran in there and said, the building's on fire, and you said, I don't smell any smoke. I mean, if something's wrong with your nose, you could be a fire before you ever knew it. Or you could say, well, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel any warmer. But now what happens if you believe the guy? You get out first. You act on it first and then say, well, uh, does anybody know whether there's actually a fire in there or not? It don't make any difference, brother. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, I saw that happen 
uh, we went into uh, Louisville, Kentucky one time for a meeting. We got in the night before the meeting was supposed to start, and just after we got into the hotel that night, there was a big nightclub and theater in that town. There was a man ran out there on the stage and said, this place is a fire. Let's get out of here orderly. Get up and go now. And he took off out that side door, and everybody sat around and said, ha, 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 they thought he was part of the show. And some of them said, well, you know, he didn't smell any smoke. And all of a sudden, the roof caved in on the thing and killed 1,200 people just because they didn't believe what that man said. Well, now that's where the Word of God is the man that runs in and tells us, and we act on it in the name of Jesus. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at this from the fourth verse, but God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, He used on you to get you born again or had you spiritually raised from spiritual death. Now listen to this that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That's talking about the new birth. And when you were born again, God placed faith to live by. It's faith you got saved by. And now it's faith to live by every day of your life. That faith right there will provide the food you eat, the clothes on your back, the, your transportation that you need to function in your ministry and in your daily life. It will provide for your spirit, your soul, for your body. Now, there are other kinds of faith, and we're going to get into that tomorrow because we're out of time today. There's natural human faith that does have to do with your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's not what we're talking about. There is the faith of God in the gifts of the Spirit or manifestations of the Holy Ghost that unto uh, one is dealt the uh, gift of faith. Well, that's not talking about this faith that I'm talking about. That's God's faith in, that is in the Spirit of God. It is a manifestation of the faith of the Holy Ghost added to your faith in a role of ministry. Praise God. When you begin to realize that God has sent faith into this earth for us to live by, to meet our needs, to be like Him, praise God, I'll tell you, it gets to be an exciting thing. We're not talking about religion, brother. We're talking about seven days a week walking in the power and the victorious overcomingness of God. Hallelujah. That phrase, the victorious overcomingness, overcomingness of God. I mean, God is an overcomer. God is never defeated. He's never stopped. He has problems, but he, he never stops with a problem. He overcomes it. And the Bible says that whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Praise God. I'm Kenneth Copeland, and this is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. That's why we're here, is to share things with you that have helped Gloria and me and my family in this ministry to develop our faith over the, over the years and the mistakes that we've made. We want to share with you the corrections for those mistakes help you develop your spirit, help you develop your, your soul, help you develop your, your body to walk in the things of God and to walk in the ways of God by faith in the blood, by faith in the Word, by faith in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for faith. We thank you for the Word. We thank you for your the, the overcomingness of your nature and your likeness. 
You are an overcomer, Father, and we want to be like you. Jesus has overcome death. Jesus has overcome sickness and disease and poverty and demons and fear and all of those things that surround us on this earth, Father. Thank God you're an overcomer, and we bless you and praise you for it, and we ask you by the Holy Spirit to show us more about it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been talking about the fact that we are a spirit. You are a spirit. I am a spirit. We are spirits created in the human class. There is a class of spirit beings that you and I call human. <laughs> I don't know. You know. I don't know where we got that name. I mean, it isn't a Bible name. God calls us man. We are of the species of man. Man was created in God's class. He created them male and female. There is a male man and there is a female man. The species is man. Like uh, an elephant is a species. Well, there are female elephants and there are male elephants, you know, but they're all elephants. Well, that's the reason you don't need to get all uptight because the Bible uses the word man instead of saying man and woman every time it used the word man. God really thought we were smarter than that to start with, but we, he's talking about the species of man. They're male, m man, and female man. The species of man was created in God's image, and God is a spirit, and, and we're living in this spirit realm, the spirit world, and and there's more detail, there's more regulatory activity in the spirit realm than even in the realm of physics or this natural physical realm that we see and perceive to our touch, and to our smell, to our taste, and to our hearing and so forth. The spirit realm is where God is. God is a spirit. He is the spirit. He is the spirit realm. And when you were born again, you were born into his household. Your spirit then was the you that was reborn. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. Now, in this spirit man, you notice every time I talk about the spirit, it's, it, it's a, it is just the most natural thing in the world to do this. Your spirit man, the reason the Bible calls it your heart, the Bible's a spirit book. When it talks about the heart, it's not talking about this blood pump. It's talking about the core, the center, the center of the being, the innermost being, as one translation puts it. The Bible said in the 27th chapter of Proverbs that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Well, that's where God's light shines is in the spirit of man. This is where you have contact with God, not here, in here. Now, let me prove that to you in a way that will really make sense to you. Fear is also a spiritual force, and fear is perverted faith. Fear is what originally was Adam's faith, and when he bowed his knee to the devil, he took upon him the nature of the devil, and the spiritual forces that were in the devil, which were perverted, perverted the spiritual forces in Adam. So what was love became hate. What was courage became discouragement or dismay. What had been faith was turned into fear. Now, it still has all the characteristics of faith, but it works in just the opposite manner. Faith in God gives me peace and quietness. Faith in a rattlesnake's ability to hurt me gives me fear. Do you follow that? Actually, fear of a snake is faith in that snake's ability to do me harm. And a lack of faith in my ability or in God's ability to protect me from it. Now, that ought to let you know the difference between faith and fear right there. When we closed yesterday, we were talking about the fact that fear will change the physical body. Fear will make you sick. Well, if fear will make you sick, uh, why is it so outlandish to realize that faith will make you well? Well, it isn't. I mean, it's not outlandish. It's not foolishness. It's just good Bible sense. Amen. 
Now, let me show you another way. We were talking about the core of man. This is where faith is, is in here. This is where the love of God is, is in here. This is where you'll hear the voice of God is in here. Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, they all had these things on their heads. That's not what he was talking about. Besides that, God spoke more than once and out in the, it, his voice invaded this natural realm and a bunch of them thought it thundered. <laughs> How many times do you reckon God tried to get your attention and he went ahead and spoke out loud and you said, did y'all hear something? Did y'all hear thunder? What was that? Was that, a, was that a jet breaking the sound barrier? What do you know? I wonder what that was. Could have been God. And you like me, you said, dense, you didn't hear it. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, God's been speaking to you and me all this time. Oh, I wish he speak to me. He has been deaf. <laughs> yeah, like you and me and all the rest of us have been so spiritually dense we couldn't hear him. He is a spirit. Start listening in here. Listen for your faith. Don't try to feel for it. Your, your body may feel the results of it occasionally, but you wouldn't know the difference. It, you wouldn't know the difference whether it's fear or faith. I mean, all you get either way is goosebumps. How are you going to know the difference? Don't try to judge faith and spiritual things of God by the way you little old, you little old, little old puny body would think about it. I mean, you, you couldn't conceive God with your body anyway. Dear Lord, my friend, he is the God Almighty of the universe. And here you're trying to boil him down to the size of a goosebump. Dear me, how foolish can, can you get? I don't know. We've all been that foolish one time or another. Now, this will uh, uh, we'll help you re in your realizing the difference between your spirit, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body. Fear is a spiritual force, same as faith is. And um, perfect love casteth out fear. Faith worketh by love. So faith is that force in love that'll cast out fear. But now let's talk about fear for a moment because you're more acquainted with that than you are faith. If I were to sneak up behind you and you didn't know I was there and I startled you and I, and I said, boom, something like that, you know, you, isn't that what you do? You wouldn't go, oh, why? Why wouldn't you grab your head? Fear don't come out of your head. When somebody is afraid to get on an airplane and fly, or somebody's startled and say, whoo, my heart come up in my mouth. Think about those phrases. A lot of those phrases that we use like that are spiritually correct. They're, they're a knowing that you have in your, inside your spirit man that that's exactly what happened. And we say things not realizing that what we said was really spiritually correct. People say things like, you know, I'm taking a cold. That's exactly what you do. You take it. If you refuse to take it, the thing can't stay on you. But most people go ahead and take it. They speak for it. Now, when that fear is released, you say, oh, my heart jumped right up in my mouth. My goodness. I just, whew, oh, you know, like that. Well, that's where faith is. Now, don't try to feel faith. Don't, don't try to feel for it like that. Listen for it. Listen for it. There is a knowing on the inside that as you develop your faith walk, as you develop your spirit in the Word of God, as you develop your walk with the Holy Ghost, as you develop your walk with God and get out of that traditional religion kind of idea of thinking and one day, oh, glory to God, don't we feel God? And the next day you come in and say, oh, I lost the victory. I just don't feel a thing. It doesn't have anything to do with the way you feel any day because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the world. So you go around praying, oh God, be with me. Oh God, be with me. Oh God, be with me. That don't develop anything but unbelief. You go to the Word and it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Then instead of praying, oh God, be with me. I wish I could feel you or something like that. You begin to pray, thank God you're with me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And you say it the loudest when you don't feel it or you feel the worst. That is the beginning of the development of your inner man. That is the beginning of becoming a spiritual adult, to walk on the Word instead of by your feelings. Now, I want to talk to you a moment about the faith of God. We read yesterday Ephesians 2.8. Let's read it again. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. That faith that we're talking about that you got saved by, the faith that the just shall live by, we, we know that's the faith it's talking about because it uses the word just. Then that means justified or born again. That's when you got born again. So, uh, the just shall live by faith. Now listen to this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Somebody said, well, I thought the grace was the gift of God. Well, it is. You didn't give your own grace. Or faith. It's both from God. But we're not talking about grace right now. We will one of these days, but right now we're talking about this faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Or in other words, when you were born again, the Bible said any man that is in Christ is a new creation in Christ Jesus you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That faith was put in you when that happened. That's what caused it to happen. And you were created, you are his workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good work. What works? The works that faith and grace will do. The works that faith will cause to come to pass as you walk in that faith before him. Now, that's the faith we're majoring on. But for, to clarify some things here, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where it says here that... Uh, wait a minute, I turned to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All right. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Praise the Lord, we're not going to be ignorant. Isn't that good news? You know that you were Gentiles carried away into those dumb idols even as you were led. I give you to understand, oh, thank God we're going to understand, praise the Lord, that no man speaketh by the Spirit calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. That's the reason I say it all the time, praise God. Now there are diversities or differences of gifts actually this word gifts is translated later as um, uh, manifestations. And I want you to realize that that's what this is talking about. This is manifestations of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to this. There are differences of administration, but the same gift. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God with worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, so forth and so on. It talks about the gifts of healings and working of miracles, discerning of spirits and so forth. Those manifestations of the Holy Ghost are just that. They are manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our midst for us to profit or for our needs to be met in and around and in behalf of times of ministry. Those are ministry manifestations. One, one great apostle of faith, Smith Wigglesworth, explained it like this. He said, I stretch my faith, the faith he got born again with, the faith I believe God with. He said, I stretch my faith as far as it'll go. When I stretch my faith as far as it'll go, then I'm expecting the Holy Ghost to come alongside and add His faith, that's that manifestation of faith, to finish the job. Praise God. So, we're talking about the faith of God that was imparted into our spirit when we were born again, and here we're talking about the faith of God added to our faith in the Holy Ghost's uh, role of ministry. And that comes as you and I minister to other people. That we, don't, we don't use that for ourselves. That's not, what, that's not the way that works. Now, this, this is a ministry too. Now, there is such thing as just natural human faith. I mean, if there wasn't any such thing as just natural reasoning faith, you wouldn't have, you absolutely wouldn't have the courage to walk outside your front door. Some people don't. 
Some people get so hung up in fear, even their natural human faith is all fouled up and messed up. They won't even leave the house, won't get outside the, the door. Some of them won't even leave their, their chair and just finally turn inward until they've what? You say, well, he lost his mind. Well, actually what he did, he's lost control of his soul, his will. He doesn't will to get out of that chair. His emotions, he's so emotionally tied to the thing, he's so bound by it, he can't move. And his mind, he's, he's lost the, the control of his thinking processes and they've, they've jumped the traces, and he, as to, so to speak, and he's, he's thinking the devil's thoughts after him and he's afraid he won't move. So natural human faith is that I can, I can look around here, I can look at this, this big sturdy platform here and I realize that it is strong enough that I can put my weight upon it. I didn't get that from God. I originally, because I'm created in the species of man and I have this thing on the inside of me, this natural human faith or ability to have confidence um, I have that and I, I can look at this thing and tell where it'll hold me up or not. And, and I, I can look at a chair and see that I can sit down in that chair. But that's not the faith that we're talking about. And that works in the area of the will if you really want to know the truth. It, we, as we have time, we'll get over into that some and show that to you. It comes in the area of will power. It comes from the intellect and comes from feeding the intellect properly on the Word of God and you won't have fear to live this daily life and to make decisions and, and do and so forth. But that should be subordinate to the faith that God has given you to live and walk by supernaturally according to His Word. Now, faith then that we are majoring in is this faith from God that we read in the book of Ephesians and then we can, we can back that up from the fact that we find over at Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he said, pray that we be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men for all men have not faith. Now, all men then don't have faith from God. All men have that natural faith. They all men... Uh, can't have that thing. But now let's go over here to the book of Romans. We'll close with this in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you. Now he's writing this letter to a bunch of born again, Holy Ghost filled believers in Rome. To every man among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man. Now, not every man in the whole world, but every man among you. Every born again man, according to Ephesians 2.8, according as God has dealt to every man among you the measure of faith. Now, I want to close this today with you realizing that you didn't get a little dab and somebody else got a whole great big bunch. The grain of mustard seed faith that Jesus spoke about was not then and is not now a measurement of how much faith you got. Now, I'm going to show you that Maybe get into it tomorrow. I, I'm, I'm believing we will because it is so exciting. But you've got faith. Say it out loud. I have the measure of faith. I'll tell you, <laughs> to realize that God, the creator of all things, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who raised him from the dead, has put faith in you and faith in me to walk and live as overcomers. Praise God. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 5, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for it. We ask you now to reveal it to us. Show us how to walk in it. Show us how to feed it. Show us how to develop the faith of God. 
Father, it's your faith, and we receive it in the name of Jesus, and we ask you to develop it in us. We receive Jesus as the author and the developer of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's review just a moment several things. One, you are a spirit. It was the spirit of you that was reborn. The real you is a spirit being. You will live throughout eternity. Every spirit that has ever come into manifestation cannot be put out of existence. Therefore, any spirit that still has the nature of the devil in him, he's never made Jesus Christ the Lord of his life. I'm not talking about your body now. I'm talking about your spirit. Has to be incarcerated in hell itself because the spirit of man is the highest ranking spirit that God has ever created and stands in that same uh, creative class with God. And we can see through God manifested in the flesh as a man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we can see how powerful a man is in the power of God. We can see in other ways how powerful a man is in the power of darkness and the power of Satan. See certain leaders in the world today that it just would not do to allow that spirit being loose in the earth full of the devil without this body to uh, constrict and restrict that person. So... That's where hell comes in. Now, the Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. But if you belong to the devil, you get the judgment of the devil, and therefore you have to be put in jail with him when your body is removed from your spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your spirit feeds on spirit food and produces a spiritual force, which is called faith. Your mind feeds on the Word of God as intellectual food and produces an intellectual force that's called willpower. Power of the will. The physical man eats physical food and produces a physical power or strength that is called strength or physical force. Now, Jesus said those things that are spirit are spirit. Those things that are flesh are flesh. God is a spirit, and those that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, we contact God in our spirit being. We don't contact him with our mind. He's not in our mind. He influences our mind, but he's not in your mind. He's in your spirit. Your mind is in your spirit. He is in your spirit. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ, but in order to walk in it, we have to renew our minds according to the Word. Now, I want us to go back again and look in the Word of God. We closed yesterday with this scripture in Romans chapter 12, where the Word of God says in the third verse, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you. He's writing this letter as all other of the letters from the book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Hebrews, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Titus, Philemon, the book of Revelation. All of these letters are written to the body of Christ. They are written to born again, Holy Ghost indwelt, Holy Ghost on dwelt believers. These people are the ones that these letters are written to. That's the reason you ought to major in these letters. That's where your life is. That's where your faith is. Now, now listen. I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. According, now this is the way we're supposed to organize our thoughts. We're supposed to think according as God has dealt to every man. That's not every man in the whole world. He's talking about 
saving faith. He's dealt unto every man the measure of faith. Now, what measure of faith is that? All right, let's go over here to the book of Ephesians. Somebody said, I thought it was mustard grain. No, no, that's talking about entirely another thing. It's talking about faith, but it's talking about it from an entirely different viewpoint. In the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, the 16th verse, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You get wisdom and revelation in knowing him, and it's revealed in you after you were born again. The Spirit of God is in you in, with that revelation. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. Now listen. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward or toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Dear Lord, what a question. He said, I want him to reveal unto you the answer to this question. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. His greatness of his power had to be for us, the believer. That's the reason he raised Jesus from the dead. Otherwise, what is the use in sending him to Calvary for in the first place? He died there for us. And what is that great power to us who believe according to the working, the spiritual working? of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. What does it have to do with us? All right, now, he comes down to the second chapter and says, You has he made alive who were dead in trespasses in sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. So even before you got born again, you were a spirit, you had a soul, and you lived in a body. But you were of your father the devil. That's what Jesus, the term Jesus used talking to some very religious folks, but they were not of God. And you were by nature the children of wrath, and you fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath made us alive together with Christ. In other words, now you remember it used the words work, the great power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? All right, now follow that because here he's answering that question. What is it, what is the working of that mighty power to me or to you, the believer? Now listen. Even when we were dead and sinned, hath made us alive together with Christ, has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any, see there's that word works again, not of works lest any man should boast. No man did this. God did it. For we are his workmanship. He exercised and worked his mighty power in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. When you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, exactly, not one iota less, of course not one iota more, because it was all of God's power and all of his might was worked in your spirit when you were dead in your sins and trespasses. 
Jesus was dead in our sins and trespasses. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. And the same working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead, he worked in your spirit, raised your spirit from the death of sin and trespass, and raised you up together, made you alive together, together, together. That's what that word together there means. Together in Christ and with Christ. So the same measure of power or faith the same measure of God's faith that it took to raise Jesus from the dead, it took to raise your spirit from the dead and cause you to be reborn. And that faith and that power that he worked is worked in you and the power of God's faith is in you now. Praise God Almighty. Somebody shout and say amen with me. Hallelujah. Now then, that measure that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead is the same measure of God's faith that's residing in you now. I said, dear Lord God, if that's true, I mean, God created the heavens and the earth. How come I can't create a planet? Well, it's the same faith. But the Bible said that he created the heavens and the earth through wisdom and understanding. <laughs> he's got all, he's a whole lot smarter about using that faith than you and I are. Amen. Oh yeah. I doubt seriously if you could create a BB, much less a planet. But, well, what's the difference? It's the same faith. But you and I, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by his word. You and I don't have that much revelation about faith. That's what we're doing. We're learning about it. Hallelujah. But then right on the other hand, you have done and will do in the future things that are far greater in their scope than creating the heavens and the earth. Because the things that happen to a, a man, a, a woman, a female, man, a male, man, anybody in the species of man to be born again, Woo, glory be to God. That's the most fabulous miracle there, there is, and it'll come as you minister to someone the words of your mouth in the words of God in your mouth, your faith flowing out your mouth as you minister to that person. They be born again. Where do you think the miracle faith came from? came out of your spirit, out of the Holy Spirit as he anointed you to speak the words of the message. And as you're a witness to Jesus, praise God, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Cast out devils and speak with new tongues. Praise God. And Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Well, thank God he went. Hallelujah. Now then, Faith, then, is from God. God has given to every man among us the measure of faith. It is the works of God, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, this faith and the grace by which it came. Now, let's go over to the book of Mark because I want to introduce you to something that we're going to discuss and talk about all week that is going to become very, very close to you for the rest of your life, not just on this earth, but the rest of your life, including eternity. The unique part of man, the part of man, not just his spirit part, but the part of him that's like God that we don't see in any other of God's creation in this earth. And this earth is what we're having to deal with. The part of us that's like God is our ability to choose words and speak them and thereby choose our own eternal destiny. The Bible said, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, listen to what Jesus said. Now, remember, the faith that is in you the faith that is in me, the faith to live by, the faith you got saved by, the faith that is product of your spirit. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the very substance of the bringing to pass your dreams and your imaginations in God. 
Now, there are people that, uh, that are not of God that teach imagination and visualization it's, that, that's all whacked out of place, but that doesn't mean that it is not a truth, and they're using a part of the truth, but we're putting it all together, and in the name of Jesus, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over our spirit, soul, and body. Now, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, have faith in God. This is Mark eleven twenty three. 23. The cross reference says, have the faith of God. Well, let me ask you something. Do you have the faith of God? Yes, amen. I've been dealt the measure of faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, that is a fact. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's a mouth of three witnesses out of the New Testament. Let it be established. Now, have the God kind of faith, for verily I say unto you that whosoever, so whosoever will say it can have it, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart or in his spirit, but shall believe that those things which he saith, what are those things which he saith? Those things which he saith are words. Believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And Jesus said, have the faith of God. This is the way you release the faith of God. So we know we have the faith of God if we've made Jesus Christ the Lord of our life and he said this is the way you use it or release it. Faith is released in words and corresponding actions. Right now we're going to major in the fact that our words should be filled with faith. Now, Jesus said... Of your words shall you be justified. Of your words shall you be condemned. And you will stand judgment for every inoperative or idle, no good word that comes out of your mouth. So what we must do then is go to God's word. Since it's God's faith, we go to the exceeding great and precious promises that the apostle Peter says we become by those promises partakers of the divine nature. We go to the promises, put them in our mouths and speak them, act according to them and speak to the mountain of sickness, to the mountain of disease in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ so that his faith and our faith are working together toward the removal of this thing out of our lives, out of our circumstances and change this natural physical world by speaking faith and acting faith until the thing bows its knee. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Glory be to God. A mechanic needs the right tool to tune a car's engine. A builder uses the correct equipment to build a strong foundation. Live a victorious Christian life and use your faith the way God designed it. The Faith That Works package will help you get the breakthroughs you need and become the spiritual powerhouse God has called you to be. This package includes the Faith That Can Move Mountains Lifeline Kit, a 10-day spiritual action plan by Kenneth and Gloria Copeland that is filled with practical teaching on faith, interactive devotional questions, scriptures, worship music, and more. The How to Put Your Faith to Work CD series by Kenneth Copeland will help you use your faith on purpose and make your life better, full of peace, health, and freedom. Let your faith soar to new heights and experience living active faith as you read the book Force of Faith by Kenneth Copeland included free. Your faith is a game changer. Put it to work today. Order the Faith That Works package and receive all three faith resources for $37.99 and enjoy a special savings of 30%. Log on to kcm.org slash TV special and request your package today. This Lifeline Kit CD series and book will help you find the answers you need about faith and how it works each and every day. Develop your faith and walk in victory. Order the Faith That Works package today. 
For an additional 10% off, order your package online. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if you heard this broadcast today, then you heard the Word and faith is present in your heart. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, then you have in you right now the, the uh, more than enough faith just to respond to His grace and everything He's done for you. If you've never been born again, then pray this with me. Just say this, Oh God in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name and I receive your forgiveness of all my sin. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take my life and do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, I know it was simple, but you're born again and the power of God's faith is in you right now. And Kenneth and Gloria Copeland have something that they would like to send you absolutely free, just called The Salvation Package. It's a book called He Did It All For You by Kenneth and Gloria. And along with that book, we're going to send you two brochures about how to study your Bible, how to read your Bible. And now that you've got this faith in you, it's important that you know how to use it how to develop it, how to release it. And these free teaching materials are going to help you understand who you are in Jesus, who Jesus is in you, and what belongs to you as a child of God. So request your free salvation package today. Go to kcm.org. Let us know you want it, and we'll get it to you absolutely free. Also want to let you know that the Washington, D.C. Victory Campaign starts November 13th, goes all the way through Saturday, November 15th. So join Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. They'll be at the Hilton Memorial Chapel in Woodbridge, Virginia. This is very close to our nation's capital. Listen, God is our source. He's your source. Put your faith into action. These are very, very important, very exciting times that we're living in. This is why you and I need to get into meetings like this. This is KCM's last meeting of the year. So come get in there, put your faith into action. And if you can't be there in person, you can always join us live on kcm.org. Connecting with Kenneth Copeland Ministries has never been easier. As social media outlets continue to grow, KCM continues to adapt to this ever-changing digital landscape. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest are only a sampling of the avenues we use to interact with our partners and friends around the world. Social media also allows us to share breaking news and provide better customer service. Check out our official blog at kennethcopelandministries.org for exclusive video content and the latest ministry news. The Believer's Voice of Victory magazine was first printed over 40 years ago as a four-page newsletter. Today, the same faith-filled experience you enjoy by reading the magazine has been expanded with the new interactive digital version. In addition to the powerful articles, you'll also have access to bonus content, videos, and a free product download. You may even share, search, and post to social media. The BDOV magazine is now mailed to over 500,000 subscribers every month. It's full of powerful tools that will help you grow spiritually and learn to live in victory. KCM is also part of YouVersion. Our partner's most loved daily devotional, From Faith to Faith, is now one of several KCM devotionals freely available on YouVersion, the number one Bible app. Last year, over 8.1 million website visitors found exclusive teaching content and articles to build their faith at kcm.org. Through our website, you can view the BVOV broadcast, read online devotionals, and shop for products that will encourage and empower you in your daily life. Visitors can also read the BVOV magazine in multiple digital formats and watch streaming events live or on demand. But that's only the start of what we have in store for you. Scheduled to launch in the fall of 2014, our newly redesigned website will include two exciting areas built exclusively for our partners. The Believer's Academy is an online learning center with video courses tailor-made for learning the Word and taking your faith to the next level. And our new partner community is a safe place online to connect with people of like-minded faith. For 35 years, the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast has taught people how to walk in faith every day through the power of God's Word. The BBOV airs in English, German, Russian, Spanish, and Ukrainian providing more than 885 million people access to the on-air broadcast. Viewers can watch when and where it's most convenient with on-demand access through our website and the dedicated KCM Roku channel. 
Roku connects you to the BVOB broadcast anytime you need it. Watch archived broadcasts, healing school, and much more 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you, partners. Kenneth Copeland Ministries continues to use every available voice to take the Word of God to the world and impact lives for eternity. May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound and be overflowing with hope. Fear of failure is dangerous. If you let it dominate you, it will cause you to do the one thing that guarantees failure, and that's not attempting at all. How do you counteract the fear of failure? You turn up the hope. You get alone with God and listen to Him. You meditate on His promises until you see nothing else. That's what hope is all about. It's a divine dream. It's an inner image that's bigger than you are because it's built on the promises of God. If you're a Christian, you ought to be a dreamer. Take the Word of God and build some dreams today. But God got it out, and He brought it to life the just to live by faith. And then he began to restore truth to the body of Christ. And we that started out there and he did all these wonderful things, but we way over here, man. It's been developing all this time and we're about to see the real America. You won't want to miss these special broadcasts. As most of you know, every Friday on the Believer's Voice of Victory is Offering Day. So let me read this to you from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 6. It says, Let him who is taught the word share, or you could say respond to what he heard, in all good things with him who teaches. And do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now, many of you have been sowing into this ministry and into these broadcasts for a long time. You've been partners with Kenneth and Gloria in this ministry and in the assignment that God has on their lives. And we want you to know how much we appreciate you. We thank you for standing with Kenneth and Gloria. Thank you for standing with the assignment of this ministry. And Father, in Jesus' name, I bless our partners. And if there is anybody else watching who you've got an assignment for to get involved with this ministry, I'm asking you, Lord, to speak clearly to them and, and stir in them the faith that it takes to be a part of this and to get invested in the kingdom of God and what you're doing all over the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now listen, if you missed any of this week's broadcast, you can watch it on our website at kcm.org or on KCM's Roku channel. You can always go and download and watch and get caught back up with us. I want to let you know too that the Washington DC Victory Campaign at the Hilton Memorial Chapel, Brother Copeland preaches and Gloria Copeland is having healing school. Now if you can't be there in person, you can always watch it live online at kcm.org. Now next week, Brother Copeland is back on the broadcast. So we invite you to join him and his guest, David Barton. Many of you loved when, uh, when Brother Copeland has David Barton on these broadcasts. You do not miss what they have to share. This is a very timely message for the body of Christ that is going to see us through to victory, praise God. Even in these most trying times, you don't want to miss these broadcasts. Do what it takes. Set a reminder. Do, do what it takes to make sure you tune into these. And of course, if you miss any of them, you can always go back to kcm.org and download or stream for free anytime, day or night. Praise God. Thanks so much for joining us on this broadcast today. We'll see you again next time. Until then, this is Jeremy Pearsons reminding you that God loves you and we love you. And Jesus is Lord. Thank you for joining us today on the Believer's Voice of Victory. For this week's broadcasts on DVD or MP3 on CD, go to kcm.org or call or write to us today. Remember this week's product offer. These ministry tools are designed to help you get the Word working in your life so you can experience all God has for you. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, be sure to request your free salvation package. This will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to start living your new life in victory.